And so we're going to set about exploring the world of vision. And the obvious place to start there is the eye. I don't know if you recognize the image, it's from Clockwork Orange. We'll come back to that. Um, the eye is sensitive to visible light, and visible light is only a very small part of the electromagnetic energy that we are bathed in. Um, some of which, most of which comes from the sun, some also from the stars. And most of the electromagnetic energy around us is invisible to us. We know of it and have exploited it in many technologies like television and radio and x-rays and gamma rays and so on. Um, there's nothing distinguished about that part of the spectrum that we call visible light. From a physical point of view, visible light doesn't exist. It exists, we identify something as visible light precisely because of the kind of sensitivities our eye has. If there were no human eyes, there'd be no point in drawing in saying this part of the spectrum is special. But of course, the eye evolved and it evolved in a particular place called planet Earth. And if we have a look at the kind of light, kind of electromagnetic energy, sorry, given off by our sun, it has a certain profile. Some frequencies are very well represented and others are less so. And you see two graphs there. One of them shows the profile, the outer one shows the profile of the electromagnetic radiation coming from this particular star, our sun. And the lower one shows the sensitivity of the human eye. And you can see that they match pretty exactly. If we had evolved beside a different star, we would have eyes of different sensitivity. So when we're discussing the world as revealed by visible light, that is only made possible because the eye evolved to exploit its environment, to make use of the information that's around. Now there's lots of puzzles when it comes to understanding vision. And there's no single theory of vision that can satisfy everyone. There simply isn't. There is a basic picture we can identify, which is that the brain and the eye are in a body, which is in the world, and there's changes that occur on the retina which cause or influence or modulate patterns in the brain. Those changes can come from two places. One is the world may move, so a bear might run across in front of me and that's going to cause a changing pattern on my retina. And the other is, I may chase the bear. If I'm moving through the world, that's also going to generate a changing pattern. Imagine you're walking down this leafy lane, for example. There's going to be changes on the retina which are co-produced by the movement of the trees and anything else that's moving, and also by the movement of your body. So this is the basic situation. We've got patterns of light on the retina which are associated with changes in the brain. We're not going to dig deep here, but let's just get a little very, very basic brain anatomy down. On the bottom right there, you can see the four major lobes of the neocortex, or the cerebral cortex. This is the outer layer of the brain. It looks all folded up, it looks like it's made of sausage or something like that. And we identify four big areas. The frontal lobe occupies basically the front half of the brain. At the very back, we have the occipital lobe. On either side, we have the temporal lobe. And sandwiched in between, we have the parietal lobe. This figure also shows another structure hanging down from the bottom called the cerebellum. We'll get to the cerebellum when we talk about movement. But for now, we're interested just in the neocortex on the outside of the brain. And although the eyes are at the front, they are plumbed in to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. Crazy plumbing. Whoever did this, don't get them to do your house. Um, I've indicated the plumbing schematically at the top left there with this cutaway picture from above. Um, the plumbing involves nerves going from the back of the eye to the back of the brain. But shortly after they leave the eyes, those nerves cross 
half of the fibers cross and half of them don't cross. So that by the time it gets to the back of the brain, that crossing has the effect that things that are moving in my right visual field will cause change on that part of the retina, on the left part of the retina, which will um, arrive, as it were, if we think of them as inputs, uh, to the occipital lobe on the left-hand side. Similarly, stuff moving in the right, on the left side of my visual field, after the crossover, will arrive here. So that there is a laterality in the occipital lobe, which is not right eye, left eye, but a right visual field, left visual field, as a diagram with the spoon there tries to illustrate. So that is some weird ass plumbing. It goes under the whole base of the brain after this crossover and in the back. Now we said that modulation or change in brain activity comes about because there's change on the retina. And that it's in turn comes from two sources. The world is changing and you are moving and your eyes are moving. And we will, in a later video, come back to this business of eye movement. That's the basic picture. You may have questions about seeing that no theory of vision is going to get near. There are two big stories built up around this, and they're different stories. One of them is couched in terms of the computational theory of mind. This is the language that emerged after the Second World War, when the computer metaphor became very common and productive, and people started talking of information processing. It's by far the most common way that vision is described, but it has lots of logical problems, lots of problems, but it's one way of thinking about how that changing pattern on the retina leads to our ability to see, identify, recognize things, and move around in the world. There's a whole distinct class of theories of seeing, which come from embodied approaches to cognition, which do not assume everything assumed by the computational theory of mind. The computational theory of mind treats patterns on the retina as input. It treats perception as a matter of input to a central cognitive system, and it separates perception and action in a slightly troubling way. Where we started with the jellyfish, no such separation was possible. The input is presumed to underlie the construction of a representation, or if you like, a model of the external world in the brain. This is a highly contentious point. Some approaches, computational approaches, believe this from the bottom of their heart, that this is what the brain is doing. Embodied cognitive scientists from the bottom of their heart believe this is a misleading picture. Our job here is not to sort out these stories, but to keep them separate and see what each of them provides us. So we're going to have a basic disjunction as we go ahead between computational theories of mind and embodied approaches. Computational theories are my, of mind hypothesize about what's going on inside the brain, and they typically inform themselves by using experiments in which the person sits still. So the person sits still, and something is presented, and something is presented, and something is presented. And they report back what they can see and what they can't see. Embodied theories of mind don't look into the brain. They look at the relationship between the body and the world to see how the pattern of change on the retina is influenced by one's own movement and by things moving in the world. So one looks in to a computational representational space. One looks out and looks at the relation between the body of the world. So we'll look at work that's done in each vein. We'll look at work done within the computational approach to, to seeing, and we'll look at embodied approaches as well in what comes.